Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our Plant Like a Local workshop. So, let's see, let's get started. Thank you again for joining us. Um, I hope you are all super excited to be here because we are super excited to have you join us. Uh, my name is Juan Garcia, and I'm the um, water efficiency specialist with the district, the landscape specialist here at IRWD. Um, before we do get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items with you and uh, to remember throughout the event. You will notice that your microphones are already muted. This helps us to allow our video presentation to run smoothly and to avoid any distractions. Uh, during this workshop, you will all have an opportunity to win one of our awesome water efficiency kits. Uh, there will be three questions within the presentation. Uh, so please make sure to listen carefully. We will provide you with instructions on how to send your answers and every correct answer will then be entered into our random drawing for one of these lovely uh, conservation kits, which we'll be discussing a little bit later. Um, also, we'll be sending you an email, which will include a PDF copy of the presentation slides, along with the list of our water efficiency kit winners and other information uh, related to the workshop. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the event, so definitely stick around for that. Um, we do have uh, some, I, uh, some IRWD water efficiency staff standing by to answer any kind of questions or if you're having any kind of issues. Um, there is a hotline number, as you can see there. It's just the 949-453-5656 if you need to talk to um, one of our reps. Let's see what else. So, oh, yes. So, um, for submitting questions, we're going to be using the chat feature. So, um, the best way to do this is to click the drop-down arrow in the chat area of your screen and choose everyone, then submit your questions. By doing this, it helps our team uh, ensure that your questions are collected and answered properly. So, if you have any, once again, any technical issues during the workshop, you can contact our help desk at 949-453-5656, and an IRWD representative will be available to assist you. Uh, so, let's let's test the chat feature. Let's um, let's test it by having everyone type in what community or city you are joining us from. And remember to choose the everyone option when posting your comments. So let's all just start adding some answers to the chat so we know where you're coming from and and get familiarize yourselves with that chat feature. Uh, once again, remember to submit any questions you might have. We'll try to answer everybody's questions if possible, but if not, we'll be collecting also those uh, questions and and I'll be answering them and submitting them with the email to all the participants. So uh, good luck on the um, good luck on the answers to the questions and away we go. Let's get started. So a little about the agenda today. So we have uh, we have about an hour or so to get to this presentation. So there's quite a bit of information we're going to try to cover and I want to make it of course fun uh, for everybody. Uh, last thing I want to do is uh, get stuck on some technical uh, information and uh, it's all very relative uh, and should be fun, you know, just like gardening in general. Um, so some of the things we're going to be talking about creating a beautiful landscape, you know, reducing overall water need purpose of landscape. Plant characteristics, creating your plant list and good thing is I already created some for you. Uh, lawn substitutes we're going to look at and of course, some of the sample plant palettes that I've already done for you. So. Let's um, let's get going. Um, when it comes to creating a beautiful landscape, the main thing on this section just wanted just to just to go over. It'll be kind of quick. It's just, you know, uh, try to reduce your overall landscape's water need. You know, uh, main thing is we want to have a beautiful, lush landscape. Yes, and we can achieve that and still be efficient with our water use. Uh, you know, it, we started looking at our lawn areas. You know, lawn areas. You know, it's it's. You know, I'm not a Lawn haters is one thing that you got to really consider how much lawn do you actually need? Is it is it functional? Is it providing a purpose? And later on, we're going to be looking at other opportunity of using plant material to create that that um, that aesthetic appeal that a lawn has as being flat and green, but with utilizing plants that use very very little water. So uh, convert to climate appropriate plants. We're really going to talk about, and of course, the use of California native and non-native climate appropriate plants, and the use of more decorative hearts. Uh, hardscape materials. 
Now, when it comes to, you know, why, why reduce the amount of lawn? You know, lawn requires quite a bit of water for every thousand square feet, right around 25 to 35,000 gallons of water per year, which is around 4,000 plus gallons during the summer months, you know, quite a bit of water that the lawn needs. And once again, is it providing any kind of use or is it just sitting out there taking all this water and other uh, maintenance that it requires, you know, highly maintenance and high, lots of water. Let's see. So, you know, consider uh, converting to a climate appropriate landscape, you know, by doing so by using medium water use plants or even water, more water thirsty plants, you can reduce your overall water need by anywhere from 30 to 50%. So now that that 35,000 gallons per year turns right right around 15 to 20,000 gallons around 2,500 gallons per month during summer peak times. Uh, by using plants that lose use even the less amount of water, low water use plants, you know, we reduce that water use even more 60, 80% water use. And you can see those numbers drop dramatically during the summer months. Now, my, my thing I really want to talk about is, is use of California native plants. Now, uh, we're going to be talking about this quite a bit, but, you know, California native plants, beautiful, lush plants that are native to our environments, to our ecosystems. Um, we build habitats for our pollinators by using utilizing California native plants. Um, you know, 80% plus uh, water savings, of course. And some of those bullet points there, you know, fully or partially summer dormant. That's one of those things that we really have to consider is that while most of our plant mature, our non native plant mature right now is starting to go into their dormancy periods, you know, our, our native plants are actually starting to wake up, which is great. Um, they do require little to no supplemental water once they're established, but depends on the year. You know, so far we've been having a little bit of a dry year, so we might have to be that supplemental water for that native landscape. It's still going to require some water, but not compared, uh, not as much as compared to our our other types of, of landscapes. Okay. Uh, so purpose of landscape. So one thing we always have to consider, you know, it is that time of year where we start, you know, it's planting season. That's, you know, what are we going to use that landscape for? So just, just food for thought. Um, you know, if it's going to be just for aesthetics, you know, what kind of materials are you going to start using, whether it's plants or even hardscape materials? Um, do you want to have areas of relaxation? You know, one thing I always think about our landscapes is creating these outdoor rooms, these outdoor living spaces. And this next slide is really going to show a dramatic picture of what uh, we could call a an outdoor uh, living space, but here we have a nice little fountain with a nice, nice little chairs and the table, utilizing that landscape as relaxation areas. You know, here's very dramatic. You could said outdoor living spaces, but why not? You know, you look at this beautiful fireplace. You know, is it going to require any kind of water maintenance? No, it's, it looks beautiful. It's a great aesthetic, but what a great use of space out in the landscape. You know, it should be used for entertainment. You know, edible gardens is what's one thing that we really have to look at is, um, is you know, do you want to have an edible garden, you know, a different way of, of landscaping, of gardening in general, you know, water requirements, uh, they it varies throughout the season. So, um, and of course, overall plant care, you know, we're talking about a whole nother um, types of plants that we're going to be utilizing, but throughout the years, we do have workshops on edible gardens. Uh, we do. Uh, these workshops are, are hosted by the Master Gardeners of Orange County. We partner with them, and so I know that we will be having uh, edible gardening class coming up um, once the, we get past this winter time. Uh, one thing to always consider when when gardening or landscaping is the watershed approach. You know, creating healthy soils, uh, trying to capture rainwater as a resource, the use of uh, climate appropriate plants. Um, having an efficient irrigation system out there, if we have to use it for for watering our landscapes, um, harmony with our local ecosystems. You know, we want to protect our overall watershed. We want to create these habitat habitat sanctuaries. You know, by utilizing California native plants, we are encouraging a healthy ecosystem and encouraging all these beautiful pollinators to to interact with our landscapes. And you know, it provides a benefit to the environment, to us, to our plants, and uh, just a great way to really approach a landscaping project. Uh, when it comes to our plants and soils, you know, one thing is you're trying to build up our soils, but one thing is mulch, mulch, mulch. And I think mulch is a very important thing when we're out there, whether it's cleaning up, you know, preparing our, you know, right now is it's also maintenance season for our, our landscapes. They're starting to wind down from the summer. We're going to do a little cleanup out there, whether it's weeding. Um, I like to use uh, 
newspaper as a as a cover underneath the mulch uh, once you're done weeding a bed uh, instead of using uh, landscape fabric and stuff it, once again it'll break down and become part of your soils but mulch i mean there's so many benefits when it comes to mulch uh such as erosion control you know controlling weeds but also you know it, it lowers that soil temperature retains that moisture and you know it's it's beneficial to our living organisms that are thriving in our soils and we need those we need that living soil we need those organisms doing their things uh in our soils breaking down uh, nutrients making it available for our plants we have fungi just a lot of beneficial stuff going on in our soils and we want to make sure that's going on you know also by practicing good watering practices keeping our soils healthy does help that out quite a bit um, capturing rainwater we talked about it you know if when we do get rains you know we want that water to stay within the landscape and we can achieve that by maybe turning our gutters straight into our landscapes uh, trying to slow that water down, slow it down, spread it, let it allow it to sink back into the ground and, and be available for our plants, for our root zones. Uh, you know, by creating in some, uh, whether they're little basins, swales, rain gardens, little bioswales, where little, little low points where water is able to collect in our landscapes and be useful to our plants and, you know, get back into the groundwater system. You know, contouring your landscape to, to create these low points, to create the, the water holding capacity of that landscape, uh, creating little dry creeks, little pond areas, um, you know, rock gardens and so forth. You know, utilize a lot of uh, artscape materials in your landscapes as well to create that permeability. Here we have uh, a landscape that has a little dry creek bed. You can see it's also been graded, has that nice little low point. You can see here it's graded so water is able to come off in these areas. It's able to collect here especially on a nice downpour of rain. So when we, you know, so it is planting season. So a little things that we have to always consider when, when looking at plant material uh, for our properties is, you know, we got to look at all these little characteristics that are important to consider when selecting plants. You know, do you want to have deciduous trees, deciduous plant material? Do you want to have evergreen plants? You know, what are, you, what, what are we looking for? Trees, shrubs, ground covers? Are we looking at perennials? You know, what's our blooming periods going to be? Do we want annuals? Are we looking at biennials, things that will come into bloom every other year? Um, what, a, what a great way for your landscape to change throughout the year, whether it's blooms. Uh, later on, we're going to talk about uh, color change as well when it comes to foliage. Uh, plant forms, you know, are we looking for tall plants, spreading plants, uh, mounding plants? Just all the little characteristics that we have to consider when we're looking at plant material, you know, one thing also is um, I believe it's going to be coming up a couple slides is is it's uh, size and spread. You know, how big is it going to get? Are we overcrowding our landscapes? How much space do we have? Uh, one thing also, you know, that I love is you know color change throughout the landscape. You know, what kind of colors are we going to look at? You know, we're going to look at those warm colors, the bright colors that really come at you, you know, um, in the landscape. When do they flower? Uh, cool colors as well. Cool colors uh, accents other materials in your landscapes. Um, our greens, our blues, our violets, those are all our cooler colors. So start thinking about that that color change or that color wheel. Uh, that's very important in our landscapes. You know who you know who does not who doesn't like to have a beautiful, colorful garden landscape. Um, you know this is a dramatic uh, chart. You know I I saw this chart. I just put it on here. Is you know maybe start looking at different blooming periods. Uh, Start looking at your plants, your plant selections, your plant lists, and when do they come in and out of bloom? Uh, are they gonna Are they gonna go into deadhead? Or you want to collect that seed? There's a lot of things to consider when it comes to uh, the blooming of our plants. Also, you know, when are we gonna? Like I said, I mentioned. I think I mentioned deadheading is just cleaning up all those dead flowers and to promote new flower uh, spurts and, and growth in general. You know, also the our 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 foliage color, our leaves, you know, changing color. You know, do you, you can see how you just don't want to have a green landscape. You could have different colors when it comes to foliage as well, whether they're the reds, the blues, the grays, the variegation on some of them. And you can see just uh, how you can have a you know beautiful uh, landscape just by you know by the foliage itself, just a different color change. And also, you got to think about seasonal change. You know, how is that landscape? Uh, the color are going to change throughout the year, throughout the seasons, by incorporating this different plant material. To the left, you know, very dramatic uh, color change there by the ginkgo, 
Uh, to the right is uh, this. That's the Vitus Californica, the the, the wild grape. Uh, but that's actually Rogers Red uh, to the right. So the whole grapevine uh, in the fall will turn nice and red, and everything will drop, and you'll see that beautiful vine underneath. I mean, what a gorgeous uh, seasonal change you get from a beautiful uh, native cultivar. You know, scale and proportion, that's that's a big thing. You know, how big is this plant going to get? How, you know, how, what's the spread on this thing? Is it going to push other plants out of the way? You know, if you have the room, then you can get away with using plants that will achieve a bigger scale or a bigger spread. You know, smaller areas, you have to really be careful on, on some of the plant material. You know, those labels, uh, those tags on plants will tell you quite a bit as far as heights and spreads. You know, really take that into consideration. Also, a lot of, you know, do your research before. Um, selecting plants, you know, look at that um, overall height and spread on those plants. And also, one thing you got to consider not only, you know, above ground, but what's going on below ground? You know, what are the, what's the habits of those roots? You know, you can see this beautiful ficus. You know, I love ficuses. Um, you can leave them in pots forever. They will gird of themselves, but be very, very careful. You know, that's it goes a lot with that research. Where do those plants come from? Uh, how you know, what are the growing habits of those plants in naturally, and are those roots really going to do um, do some damage to your property? You got to really always consider that. Very important. Okay, let's see. Oh, here we go. So we're off to giveaway question number one. So. Um, so it's time for our first opportunity uh, to be entered into the drawing for this water efficiency kit. So uh, what's in this water efficiency kit? Well, there's a moisture meter, rain gauge, a hose timer, a hose repair kit, and a hose nozzle. It's ideal for any kind of gardeners, landscaping fans. So question number one is name three plant characteristics to consider when selecting plants. Email your, email your answers to rightscape at irwd.com by 5 p.m. tomorrow, November 4th, to be entered. Once again, correct responses will be entered into a drawing. Now, this is a random drawing. Um, you know, we we, ent we put all the answers in the name uh, in, into this um, program that we have, and it will naturally, it'll just by itself select the winners for the, for the, uh, for the giveaway. So please let's see. Name three plant characteristics to consider when selecting plants. Once again, email your answers to rightscape at irdb.com by 5 p.m. tomorrow, November 4th. Okay, once again, if you have any questions, please start submitting them through the chat features. All right, creating our plant list. Let's start to create our beautiful plant list. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we got to look at the plants that we want for our landscapes, right? Um, we're going to be looking at, well, what are California friendly plants or drought tolerant plants or climate appropriate plants? What are California native plants? Is there a difference between them? Oh, when you when you group them all together as far as climate appropriate plants, not really, but when you actually start to look at these plants and where they come from and how they acclimate to our environment, you know, it's really, really important to look at, you know, to really uh, split those two categories apart. Um, we've got to look at our overall climate, you know. you got to remember that California is not a desert. You know, we do have deserts in California, yes, but in California, we have a beautiful, very unique climate throughout our state, you know, from the south all the way to the north. You know, you really got to look at California into these different um, eco regions. Um, you know, we have our desert eco regions, such, such as the Mojave Desert. We have our Mediterranean eco regions uh, that could be considered like our Central Valley. Uh, we have our forested mountains, you know, mountain areas all the way down to our our coastal forests. You know, very unique environments or eco groups within California. Uh, so when you actually start looking at these Mediterranean climate zones, you know, we start looking at this, at these bands of our Mediterranean climates and a lot of plants that we already utilize in our landscapes come from all these different regions, the similar climate to California. So 
and I, I know I, I can bet most of you already have climate appropriate plants in your landscape. Uh, there is quite a number of plants that fall in that category that are been used in California landscapes forever. Um, you know, that are not, of course, your cool season grass and, you know, your warm season grasses, you know, that's really things that, you know, more for aesthetics. Uh, but when you start looking at the plants and looking and start to create these lists, you're going to notice that a lot of plants that we are that uh, that we're going to select already are planted. It could be already planted in our in our properties. And this is good old um, Western gardening uh, climate zone information. If you're not familiar with it already, you know, yes, in, you know, in Irvine, which we are right around here, we're right in between climate zone 22, 23, and 24. You know, when we're looking at California friendly plants, so these are climate appropriate plants from all over the world that are easy to adapt in our, in our, in our, in our climate, our California Mediterranean climate. Um, they are moderate water users. They do need that summer water. So, uh, and they're easy to adapt. Very, very simple. We call them, those are our medium water use plants. Now, when we start, you know, delving into, well, what's, what's better for our landscapes here? You know, well, the use of California native plants, of course, you know, there is a diversity of climate appropriate plants available. Yes, but we really start to, we really got to consider using California native plants. Um, not only because of the amounts of water they use and, you know, just, just they're well adapted to our environment already. And they just bring, once again, just so much, so it's such a benefit to our landscapes by creating that, that habitat, that little eco system for our native uh, bees, butterflies, birds that'll thrive in all these plants as well. So, you know, uh, Cowscape, if you go to the cowscape.org uh, website, it's a great website to look at plants. And later on, we are going to be visiting that site um, in a little bit. But when we start looking at, at native plants, we really start looking at our plant communities. You know, what plants, what native plants are, are native to our, our region, our little areas here. Um, you know, sure, we can manipulate some of these plants that might be from, let's say, uh, desert plants or desert communities, or even our, 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 our foresters communities as well. You know, one thing is um, being in our little unique area, Irvine, more coastalish uh, influence. You know, there's a number of plants, of course, that are native to this area, but we can kind of mix and match some here and there. But just um, I do encourage you to to try to plant local. Uh, but, you know, start looking at other plants, other California native plants that can be acclimated easily to our little environment here. Uh, so it's important to look at our plant communities and we happen to be in our coastal sage scrub plant community, Irvine and our surrounding areas. And that's very important when you're looking at plants that are uh, be able to be able, able to adapt to this uh, unique region. You know, uh, California native plants, when we start looking at our native plants, right? You know, they grow here naturally. It's, it's the most important thing. They've co-evolved here with our, our local fauna, animals, fungi, microbes. You know, you, you're by utilizing uh, native plants, you're building habitat for our pollinators, um, you know, fully or partially summer dormant. That's one thing with our native plants. They follow a different watering bell curve compared to our our normal landscapes. You know, once established, natives require little to no supplemental water beyond rainfall, but they do look better uh, with a little bit of water. Um, and that's one thing you would consider. I'm gonna, later on, I think a few slides we're gonna look at, at, a, at a chart that shows you overall water use from a, let's say a water-friendly landscape of uh, non-natives to natives. So, you know, these plants have adapted, of course, to our local conditions, you know, when it comes to our native plants, you know, there are hundreds of local uh, native plants and you're going to be later on, you're going to see a list of them. And once again, we're creating, you know, habitat for birds, insects, we're you know, little foraging hubs, you know, plants have adapted the way their leaves turn, uh, the thickness of leaves, the waxy buildups, uh, just, just very unique uh, way these plants have evolved here in California for our dry conditions or our coastal conditions or our coastal sage scrub conditions. Now, um, one thing about native plants, you know, not every single one is completely drought tolerant. You guys just remember to do a little research on where these plants are from, you know, are they from 
ponds, creeks? Do they like to be, you know, next to rivers and marshes and seeps? You know, so you might have to, um, like, for instance, you know, our coastal redwoods, you know, beautiful coastal redwoods. They love water, though. Um, that's why they look really great when you see a redwood in the middle of a lawn, uh, especially down here in these areas, because it's getting all that water from that grass area. So it'll, it'll, it'll take it and it'll, they just grow and grow and grow. So it's important to do a little research and look at the diversity of California native plants that are available to our areas. Um, so let's look at that chart I was talking about earlier. So when we look at oh this those blue columns, that's actually we uh, weather data from our central uh, weather station here in Irvine. And that central weather station is basically just measuring water loss, and that's where you can see those columns are. You know, as hot as it gets hotter throughout the summer, that grass, cool season grass, loses more and more water. And that's what we base a lot of our water budgets on, or that's what we base our water budget on, is that water loss and all these unique plant factors or plant water needs. When we do have rainfall, there's our, our normal rainfall pattern. That's the water requirement for cool season grass. If you have like a tall fescue or cool season grass, that is the water requirement throughout the year, pretty high. Um, when we look at that warm season grasses, St. Augustine, Bermuda grasses, you know, it does require a little bit less water. We do encourage the use of, of that type of grass as our budget is based on warm season grass and a mixture of climate appropriate plant material. So here are, so when you look at climate appropriate plant material, so that blue line is medium water use plants. You know, we can call them drought tolerant, climate appropriate, but basically they are moderate water use plants. And we, I'm telling you, we mo we do have quite a number of these plants already incorporated in our landscape. But you can see it follows that, that bell curve. You know, as it gets hotter in the summer, they require more water. And as it gets cooler, they require less and less. You know, we're in November. By September, we should be down about 30% of our water use compared to, to um, summertime. So if you haven't, you know, change your, your, uh, your, your run times or your days per week out there in your irrigation controllers, please do, please do so. As uh, you know, water requirements, does start to decrease and even with um, even if it is warmer now, um, you know, plants will start to shut themselves down based on the seasons. I, you know, they will require a little bit of extra water here and there because of the of the heat. But, you know, it, this overall time has shown when we look at um, all our weather data that plants do start to shut themselves down during this time period, except for what? Let's look at the native bell curve, as you can see. When we look at California native plants, it follows a different bell curve, right? It's following our natural rain patterns. So as our climate appropriate, not or exotic, non-native plants start to decrease their waters and go into slumberville, our native plants are starting to waken up and will require that water during these periods. So once again, if we do not get the rains we expect, then we might have to be our our own uh, rainfall out there by by hand watering or turning on your sprinklers and if, if you have uh, sprinklers in that area. Uh, hydro zoning, it's just a very important uh, topic to consider when just overall selecting plants. You know, select plants with similar water needs, uh, uh, exposure requirements, uh, soil requirements, how they grow, you know, you want to group these plants together. You know, I myself am a, am a plant lover. I have every single plant you can probably think of from ferns to Japanese maples to natives, but I group them together and I keep them all separate. You know, uh, my native areas in the very front, it's in a very, it's a full sun, it's in a hot spot, but throughout the summer I gave it, you know, I would maybe water one good deep soaking uh, per month during the summer times, so even if we, you know, we had this I heat this last past summer. Um, those plants did fantastic. You know, I do have some uh, deciduous native plants out there. Most of them are evergreen. And just with that little splash of water on the coolest day I could find, um, they were happy and and they look good um, compared to my other plant mature that really wanted, you know, some extra water during those that, that hot summer time. Uh, when we're selecting plant material, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of text here just talking about nomenclature just basically the botanical names of our plants and why it's important to learn those botanical names uh common names change from you know cultures people to people 
overall, you know, this is one plant that I always like to bring up. If I say, okay, what is a mock orange? You know, typically the response I'm going to get from somebody is, oh, you're talking about pittosporum. And, uh, or we call mock orange. Yeah, sure. You know, but I was, you know, pittosporum, uh, tobari is a, um, it's also a common name is Australian laurel. Uh, it's also known as Japanese pittosporum or mock orange or Japanese uh, cheesewood. Um, it is native to uh, Japan, China, Taiwan, Korea. But, you know, it's a beautiful plant. Oh, there it is right there. So, you know, mock orange, pittosporum. It is a medium water use plant. Great to use. Great. But myself, when I ask for a mock orange, I am actually looking for Philadelphus louisii, which is our native mock orange. You know, beautiful, beautiful shrub. As you can see, it bloom, what, a, what a great bloom it has. Um, you know, the natives used to use this for so many things such as... Um, Gosh, let's see, uh, tools, fishing tools, um, the flowers, you know, uh, you could use them for teas or perfumes. Um, I mean, just the leaves, uh, you know, there's so many uses, medicinal purposes, uh, uses for this plant. But overall, you know, it, as far as the landscape use, what a, what a fantastic shrub. Um, really, really beautiful shrub. You got to let this thing have the room to spread and grow and it give you that dramatic bloom. But this is this is some of the reasons on why uh, to you know to use these botanical names. You know, learn them, uh, try to use them uh, when you're looking at plants, when you're out there selecting plants. Because by using that botanical name, you're going to get exactly that plant that you're looking for. Uh, like I said, common names sometimes change. So um, some things that these botanical names will also give you information on is, of course, where that plant is from. Rosa Californica. This is our California wild rose. Uh, Rosa floribunda iceberg. I love iceberg roses. I mean, what a beautiful, that little thing there is actually, uh, it's a cultivar. Rosa telling me it is a rose. Floribunda is telling me a couple of things. Flor means abundant, bunda, flory. It's a lot of flowers. We know that iceberg uh, roses give you a really profuse bloom. Uh, the cultivars, as you can see here, when you start looking at these scientific names, Raphaelepis indica, cultivar pink lady, this is just Indian hawthorn, right? But different cultivated species of the Indian hawthorn. Pink lady, beautiful, beautiful. Um, Clara, I love the Clara, has a white flower, a little bit different shape of leaf. Um, and then you have your majestic beauty. So they're all Raphaelepis indica, but different cultivated species of them. And majestic beauty actually makes a beautiful container shrub or tall tree or not tall tree medium-sized tree small tree um, you can see this bloom it's, it's absolutely fantastic so this is actually something that was cultivated um, there's also what we look at uh, variety so variety naturally happens in nature um, this right here this is actually circus canadensis forest pansy we do have a native circus here in california called circus occidentalis but Circus canadensis is a beautiful um, eastern red bud. Uh, the forest pansy comes out with this beautiful purple uh, foliage in the spring. Uh, before it's before the, the foliage, you get that onset of the beautiful red, uh, pinkish, hot pink flowers first, just like the western red bud, and then the onset of the foliage. But here's a beautiful another Circus canadensis. This is a variety alba, eastern red bud, but it's white, white blooming. I have a buddy of mine that has this planted. He lives out in La Cunada, but his is doing fantastic, beautiful eastern, white eastern red bud. Okay, so um, plant palettes. So one thing I did is uh, is I already kind of created a small little plant palettes for different types of gardens. So here is a small plant palette for California native plants. You know, for the trees, you know, I selected Circus occidentalis, Western redbud. It is deciduous. That's there right there. You know, it's actually, you can call it a big shrub. But, you know, if you train them well, you know, single trunk or multi-trunk, you can make them into these beautiful medium-sized trees. Uh, there's also, of course, our Heteromelis arbutifolia, our Toyon, which is all over our hillsides here in California. Um, you know, beautiful evergreen red berries. It's not on here, but um, as for shrubs and all these plants are here are easy to find native plants that you can find 
in most nurseries. So you know this species, concha, uh, dendromecan rigida, bush poppies. Uh, there's uh, there's actually two uh, bush poppies. There's the island bush poppy and the bush poppy, dendromecan rigida or dendromecan hartfordi, I believe. Um, sticky monkey flower, the mimulus, coffee berry. I love coffee berry. There's they, uh, there's actually some great uh, cultivars of coffee berry around this Californica, just the standard uh, native salvia species I put on here because there's so many salvias available uh, here uh, as far as native salvias that you can choose from. And then uh, apricot mallow as well, just gorgeous um, shrubs. Um, ground covers, uh, the red buckwheat. Here's red buckwheat right there. Regonum grande rubescens, uh, Rigeron, Glaucus, the seaside daisies. Uh, gorgeous, especially the more the coastal we are, we can plant a lot of these and they do fantastic. Um, a great ground covers, uh, good old woodland strawberry for Garia Californica are one of our native um, native uh, strawberries. So easy um, plant palette for some natives. Once again, there's there's vast number of them, so we're gonna be looking at a list in a little bit. How are we doing on time? Good, we're rolling along good. Um, you know, here's a nice home landscape with California native plants. Um, and of course, I made some plant palettes with um, some climate appropriate non-native species. Uh, for instance, so here we go, Circus canadensis forest pansy, the eastern redbud. This right here is Arbutus marina. I love the strawberry trees. This is Arbutus marina. Marina has this beautiful red trunk. I mean, what a beautiful, uh, what a beautiful tree you have there. Um, some shrubs, some rock rose, Texas ranger, heavily bamboo, sweet pea bush, all very water thrifty plant material, easy to find. Uh, ground covers, some blue fescue, the stuka, the cat mint, or the creeping mirror plant here. Uh, for those of you who love winter bloomers, here's a great list of some winter bloomers. And some spring summer bloomers. Now, I am going to go through these a uh, little bit quick right now, but don't worry. You're all going to get uh, get this by email, and this presentation will also be posted, the video of it, so you have something to revert back to. If you see that little asterisk, they are California native plants. Everything, here we go, some yarrow, kangaroo paws, the thrift. You see some great summer bloomers, some fall bloomers as well. And, uh, you know, who doesn't love a blooming garden, right? And some great ground covers and lawn substitutes we're going to talk about, right? Everything from uh, Bearberry, Cotaniaster, Silver Carpet, which is Diamondia, Marguerite right here, um, Keeping My Porum, Potentia, Blue Star Creeper, Verbena, this is Verbena here. I mean, just great uh, ground covers, very, very water friendly. Um, what about herbs for California gardens as well? You know, what a great way to incorporate some some fragrance into your landscape and that you can utilize for cooking and other things. Uh, always be careful of invasive plants. You know, you can visit the uh, the UCIPM uh, IPM webpage. Uh, California Native Plant Society has great, uh, some great information on invasive plants, plantright.org. Uh, go on that website, great website uh, to look at what, what's or what's considered invasive now. You know, I remember back, oh, I can, so many years ago, back in the college days, prairie wrinkle was highly used. It is on the invasive plant species list, but another great alternative, here's our woodland strawberry that we were talking about earlier. All right, giveaway question number two. What are the benefits of selecting California native plants for the landscape? You know, we. I've been talking about a lot of benefits throughout the presentation, so just give me some uh, some benefits. Email your answers to rightscape at rwd.com by 5 p.m. tomorrow to be entered into the drawing for the conservation kits. What are the benefits of selecting California native plants for the landscapes? There are too many to name. Draw down a few. Email them to me at rightscape at rwd.com. Okay, let's move on. Oh, you know, I, I remember putting this little section in here because I always get asked about lawn substitutes. Well, um, one new plant that's come on 
really strong as of late is Karapia. Uh, new low water ground cover developed in Japan. It's been hybridized. The first or the original species actually went into seed. It was considered invasive. These fine gentlemen took it, hybridized it, and it's a fantastic ground cover, very, very aggressive. And it uses a third of the water than your you know, typical cool season grass. I mean, just fantastic ground cover. As you can see here, this uh, this is this is actually a home of one of our customers that I was driving up to to do a survey on. And as I'm getting closer and closer and closer, I, they had the greenest lawn on the block. As, as that's what I thought as from driving uh, as I was getting closer to home. But as I get as I got closer and started to look carefully, I said, "Hey, that is not a grass. That is not a lawn. What what is that over there?" And as I started walking up, I knew right off the bat that it was going to be Karapia. You know, very, very aggressive, as you can see there. Um, it does go into bloom. Uh, there are, there's a white variety, there's a pink variety, but this has been, um, you know, mowed and cared for. So it doesn't, you know, if you're, those of you worried about the blooms, you, just, you can just mow them away. And the mowing frequency on this is once every few weeks or so. Just um, very, very aggressive. And the neighbor actually had a lawn and then they actually had this uh, nice separator in between uh, the planter border. So it was able, it was great to be able to take a picture comparing the Karapi to the left and the lawn to the right. Um, whereas this, we remember we were talking about 25 to 35,000 gallons of water throughout the year. Take that divided by three and not so much. This, this will be using a third less, you know, a third of the water that this would use, if not less. This is actually uh, some pictures that we took of a, a homeowner that had this installed. So um, you pull it, it's got to be bare soil of the area. You, you plant it as plugs. This is three weeks after planting, six weeks, and then nine weeks after. Very, very aggressive. You can see uh, what a great ground cover, what a great lawn substitute. And we actually planted it here at the district. So if you're interested, you can come by here at our headquarters and you can see it out in the planter in the parking lot on the walkway. So there it is planted July 2020 and October 2020 it was completely filled in. And the more heat the better. But there are other great lawn substitutes such as Daimondia. As you can see there, that's all Daimondia, the silver carpet. Here we have creeping thyme. What a beautiful uh, way of using thyme. And oh, let's look at some on-site, well, before we get to the online resources, I mean, let's save that for, for after. What I really want to get to is, you know, we, we talked about time to plant, right? Why is it time to plant? Well, late fall to winter is always the best time for planting, whether they're native or non-native. Um, the soils are still warm enough where the roots will start to push out. And that's what we want. We want those, those plants that we put into the ground to start pushing out those roots. Right, and always, and, and you can see all the plants that they're using here in the picture, they're all one gallon. So I would highly recommend to use one gallon plants. You know, if you have to use a five gallon, great. You know, the bigger you get uh, a plant in a container, it's been acclimated to that condition. You know, it'll sometimes go through a little bit of shock when planting. Whereas these one gallons, these smaller plants will adapt better to that soil and just push out those roots and you know, you want those roots, once again, to start establishing now. Um, once they do start to establish, you know, we're going to get our winter times where they'll slowly go into a little bit of a, that, that little slow down pace. And once spring comes, you know, you have a nice, well established root system already. That plant will just push out and really start to take into that area and just be spectacular coming, um, coming, come spring. Um, so be careful, you know. The, the later we wait, you know, sure, we can start waiting a little bit more into the fall season. You know, we can start, we can keep planting into the winter, but, you know, even in spring, people say, well, can we still plant in spring? Sure you can, but the closer we start getting to that warmer period, you know, our plants will start to uh, utilize more water. If it doesn't have a good root structure, you know, you're going to have to really make sure you, um, you make sure that that soil is moist, but not oversaturated. Once again, use your mulches and, um, you know, but why now? Right now is really time to start thinking about planting. You start getting our plants into the ground. Uh, most trees, shrubs, and ground covers do best, of course, planted in late fall. 
but you, know, you got to be careful. There's some subtropical plants that are water to feed. You know, for those of you like citrus, uh, you know, be careful. Plant them later. You know, uh, as it gets warmer. You know, more springtime. Uh, bougainvillea also likes that. Bougainvillea is very, very water thrifty. One thing is the more color. You know, these are actually the bracts, the leaves that change color. Um, but bougainvillea is uh, you. You leave them alone. Uh, you kind of neglect them a little bit. Let them dry out, and they're gonna really just pop and give you spectacular um, color change. So this is a little textbook, but it's it's really important, you know, to when whenever you're doing any kind of planning, you want to follow uh, that textbook. Uh, this is just textbook 101 when it comes to planning. You know, you want to make that 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 hole, that planning hole, you know, uh, two and a half times wider than the root ball. You know, one thing I really not I. Don't, I really don't like to break up that root ball, you know, I, messing with it. Sometimes we'll put that plant in the shock. You know, I'll kind of, if I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at that root ball, make sure it's nice and white and spreading out great, and then just place it into that hole. Uh, and then you can start backfilling in. Can you add any kind of amendments to the soil? Sure, you can. You can do some, um, some compost if you want. Um, people always ask about fertilizing. Uh, you know, you could put some, um, so bone meal, bone meal, high in phosphorus, it'll, it'll, it'll start to promote root growth as well. Um, one thing that's very important, as you can see here, you want to leave, maybe make, put a little mound on the bottom of that hole, right? And you want that, that root collar, you always want to protect that root collar uh, or the plant collar from soil being piled up or just piling up too much uh, mulch against it. You want to keep, kind of keep that open. Um, you know, start to backfill, start to compress with your hands, you know, don't start standing on there and stomping around in a circle. You know, you want it to be compressed, yes, but not too much where you start to, you know, choke out that plant or just over compress that slow it down. Um, and watering, watering is very, very important. You want to maybe create a little basin around that plant you just planted and maybe another uh, outer ring around that as well. And you want to sit there with a nice, slow, steady stream of water and give that plant around a good 20 to 25 gallons of water. It may seem like a lot, but you want to make sure that water permeates all the way down into the roots, into that soil, so that those roots make contact with that soil and slowly they're going to start pushing into that area. So watering is always critical when it comes to planting. So uh, just you know, follow that good old planting guideline 101. And you're going to have great success, but make sure you water, water, water immediately. You know, of course, water the plant before planting, and then of course, water that area immediately after planting. Uh, for those of you with trees that are wanting some trees, you know, staking, uh, it's, it's it is important. You know, want to make sure that those stakes don't go through that root ball for one thing. Um, the stakes are there really for a year, two years. You know, right here it does say. Two to three years, you know, I, I I usually leave them there for about a year or two. Uh, these these ties around, it's really for support. You don't want you don't want them strangling your tree. You don't want them pulling so hard that you don't get that movement. You know, because the more that tree moves back and forth, it's going to become stronger and stronger. Also, I like to leave a little bit of the lateral branches down below as well to build that that uh, the girth of that trunk. You know, one thing. And then after that year or two, get those stakes out of there and allow that, that tree to grow in nice and healthy. And the more it moves, the stronger it'll be. So just once again, before planting, make sure you you, you soak that root ball as best as possible. Uh, take care of it when removing from the pot. Uh, sure, you know, you can put some, like I said, you can put some fertilizer uh, in the hole or even around after planting just to try to give it um, some nutrients, you know, and you know, there's always the talk of whether organic or or synthetic fertilizers. You know, I'm I'm a big believer in organics. And you know, once again, you're you're putting organic material into the air. We start using synthetics. You really got to be careful on toxicity issues and other kind of things uh, to worry about. But try to go organic. Um, Look at those numbers on those fertilizers. Those three numbers are they are important. The first number is always nitrogen, right? That's always going to give you the green and the push. Uh, the middle number is always your phosphorus, and that's going to promote flowering. 
and root development, and the potassium is kind of like the health of the the health the caretaker of the of the of the plant. It's gonna promote hardiness, good. Uh, uh, I call it a plant cell wall structure in general, but it's gonna it's just the overall uh, caretaker of your of your plants when it comes to nutrients. And you have all those other micronutrients as well that are very, very important. But once you know, again, uh, go organic if you can. All right, giveaway question number three. How are we doing on time, Joey? Oh, we're starting to wind down. But um, like I said, there's quite a number of, 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 of things to think about with this workshop. Uh, but you know, we are in planning season, so let's get started. So giveaway question number three, which season is best to begin? planting and why so when it, what is the best season to begin planting everybody i think we talked about that a bit right now so email your answers to rightscape at iwd.com by 5 p.m tomorrow november 4th to be entered into the random drawing for these conservation kits good luck to everybody okay well we are down to the very end but um of course for oh uh, guys should have fixed this slide here, but the DIY turf removal program. Okay, everybody, forget about the received two dollars per square foot because that number is now outdated. Right now, the turf rebate program is at four dollars per square foot. So um, let's forget about this two dollars, and it should be four dollars per square foot. So if you're interested in the DIY turf removal program, uh, take advantage of it right now. Uh, remove that grass area. If it's not being used, replace it with a beautiful water thrifty landscape uh, and you'll get, you know, $4 per square foot for every um, square foot of grass you remove. Uh, for more information, please visit um, rightscape.com, our rebates page. And with any of these programs, make sure to read the terms and conditions first. Do not, do not, do not remove your grass and begin your project before getting approval. So fill out those applications, take measurements, take photos, and wait for that pre-inspection and that notice to proceed before beginning any of your projects. Once again, for information on our rebates, you can visit rightscape.com. We have uh, quite a number of rebates going on from turf removal, weather-based irrigation controllers, nozzles, spray bodies, you name it. There's a lot of rebates available right now. Uh, we do have our Rightscape Resources web page. So speaking of web pages, let's 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 visit a couple here. Uh, we have our upcoming workshops for those of you who are interested. We have our Tap Water 101 workshop on November 17th from 12 to 1. Uh, December 1st, we have our MWD Garden Design Workshop. This is a workshop that's going to be put on by the Metropolitan Water District. Green Gardens Group G3, they are fantastic in their workshops. Uh, we invited them to do a garden design workshop for us. That's going to tackle the turf rebate program, a little bit of the requirements. And then in January, we have our first uh, partnership workshop with the Master Gardeners, our B BAGSI, Garden Scene Investigator Workshop, which is going to be held on January 12th. Uh, Wednesday, 2022, from 12 to 1.30, we're going to have Master Gardeners here with us. Uh, in the backgrounds, we're going to have us. What a great workshop to really utilize the webs, you know, the, the web to look at uh, different, uh, to answer questions you might have on gardening and always look at, we're going to really get into that. It's a great workshops that we have. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always email me at askwan at iraw.com. And I'll, I'll make sure I try to answer your questions as best as possible. And if I don't have the answers, I have, once again, we have great partnerships with organizations as the California Native Plant Society, Master Gardeners that we can always refer to, and they also have great hotlines and information on their website. So, okay, let's go to a couple of pages and then we'll have a Q and A and then uh, we can all be uh, done for the day. So, um, I wanted to show you a couple of things. So this is our rightscaperesources.com. This is our landscaping um, database, you can call it. On here, you can do, you can look at different gardens and gallery tours. You can start to look at different tours and let's look, click on California native gardens and you can see what kind of plants are there. 
If you like what you see, let's see, you can click on it. Wow, okay, this is uh, Manzanita. You can start adding it to a plant list. And, you know, just all the nice little things you can start doing, you know, as far as looking at all these different plants and, and gardens. What I really love is our plant search. I like to do a guided search. Let's see. So now we start looking at it. We're like, what are we looking for? Well, I want some perennials. They're going to be in full sun. Ooh, I want them to be about one to three feet. What color? If you want to be specific on your color, well, we could, but you know, I'm going to select any to get more of a list. What kind of soil do I have? Well, I'm just going to pick good old clay. You know, when do you want them to bloom? You can actually pick a blooming period, but let's select any to get a more of a vast list. And here we go. So there's about six pages that fell under that criteria that we selected. If you see this nice little symbol on here, it is a California native plant. And once again, you can start looking at them. Add them to your plant list. There you go. And you're off and running. You know, good time to spend on here looking at these different things. Um, there's also some great fact sheets on here and some other resources and watering guides. And once you're done, you can go to my, my list and everything that you've been looking at, whether they're plants or gardens, it'll start to save them on here and you can print these out or save them as PDFs. And you can uh, you can uh, group them together in these different hider zones or all pictures. I mean, it's just a great website to look at. Uh, I mentioned our Cowscape. Dot, uh, this is not ours, but this is the California Native Plant Society's Cowscape.org website. Now, I once again, I really love this website. You put in your your address. Once you do so, oh, and of course I should have done that. But San Canyon. Avenue, good old Irvine, California. Let's hit enter. And here's a list of all the plants that are native to my point on this beautiful planet, right? So it gave me a list of 541 plants. Now we can look at all those plants or we can start looking at different categories. Trees, shrubs, perennials, let's look at perennials. So here's all the perennials that are native to this beautiful area. Uh, let's see. I'm going to select ooh, the blue-eyed grass. I love uh, blue-eyed grass. Let's look at this plant. There's some nice pictures. And also great information, right, as far as heights, spreads, uh, dormancy, fragrance, flower color, you know, landscaping ideas, full sun, moisture, all the important information that, that, we, that we need. But also, who carries this plant? Well, no, I can see here that 72 nurseries carry this plant. We can click on there, and here's all the nurseries in this area. So we can start looking at areas to us. Let's see, where are we at? We are down here. Oops. There we go. Irvine. And, you know, when it comes to native nurseries, that's one thing. There's not a lot of native nurseries that are, you know, compared to standard nurseries, but, you know, we have, might have to take a little voyage, but here we have our beautiful Tree of Life Nursery right in San Juan Capistrano, and they carry that plant. You can click on here and go to the nursery page and start taking a look at what they have available, as you can see there. So great uh, search for these plants. And one of my other favorite, uh, Websites that I really love is Las Pelitas Nursery. Uh, it's laspelitas.com. And earlier we were talking about uh, plant communities. And you know, if you go to the main page here, you know, you can start looking at nature of California. You can look at different plant communities by zip code. But I know that I'm just going to click on plant communities and we'll look at these different ones. We here in Irvine are considered. Here we have the woodland and scrublands of California, which we fall under, and we are coastal sage scrub. And we start looking at this, and we can start looking at, well, what does that mean as far as coastal sage scrub? What kind of soils do we have in our environment? What's our climate here? And we can start looking at different plants. Here's a list of all the plants. But once again, uh, you can go to the calscape.org website for all the plants that are native to your address. So. Um, another great website. You have our 
Ridescape Resources website. You have the Cowscape, and of course, this is just lasperlitas.com, another great, great website. Okay, let's see, where are we at? Well, that said, let's wind it down. Mr. Joey, I think it's time for a little Q&A. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around with us. I'm, I'm glad that you are still here. Let's uh, let's get some Q and A here, but don't worry if you do have to leave us. Uh, we are going to be collecting all the Q and A, all the uh, questions asked in the chat feature, and um, I will be answering them. So um, don't fear if you uh, if we don't answer your questions. All right, Joey, let's go. Hey, Juan. So um, we got some hot three questions. I guess you could say <laughs> that it kind of apply to everyone. Um, so that's this first one we got here is um, what type of uh, a watering application do you suggest for uh, shrubs versus trees versus ground cover? You think uh, sprinklers are better or drip line? Which one? You know, they're they're all placing water out there. You know, it's just, it's all about efficiency. You know, spray heads are around seventy five percent efficient, and that's brand new right out of the box. You know, as you can say. Um, so we do lose a lot of water due to misting and just the, the nature of them. Um, you know, overhead irrigation always seems the best to me. You know, I like to water by hand. I do have a sprinkler system out there, um, you know, but I have, you know, it depends also on, on how open that area is. You know, if you can have some rain birds, let's say on some stands out there, you know, the good old ch -ch -ch or, uh, you know, that's great to just water overhead, just like rainfall. Um, if you have spray heads already out there, then just make sure that plant material is not blocking them. So that spray gets out to the area. Uh, but drip as well, you know, if, if you have a drip system out there, drip is, is also great to use. You know, just one thing about drip is um, just make sure you use it the, in an appropriate way. You know, you don't want to have that drip line just putting out water out there and oversaturating the area. You know, we always hear that drip is bad around around natives, and that's more, I think, uh, due to the user, you know, just oversaturating the area, but drip can be effective. You know, I do have drip uh, irrigation around my natives. I have some, uh, but I do have uh, micro sprays out there on the drip systems to spray that water overhead. Um, you know, it all depends really. It depends on if that system is efficient enough to to water that area for ground covers. You know, as long as those sprays can get over, you can use sprays. Uh, you know, rotors, is, it all depends on that clearance once again. But um, but drip is an efficient way to go because that water is slowly being placed out at the root zone in the area, and it's more efficient overall. It just depends once again on the application. So it's it's really hard to say which is the best to use just depending on how, how, how that system is already built on your property. Perfect. Thanks. Um, we have a lot of people that look like they're interested in the um, turf removal program, yes. which is great. Um, but they're also asking, when is the best time to remove my lawn before I start? Oh, that's a good question. You know, um, you know, anytime really. You know, uh, I I participate in that turf removal program, and I, I think when I did it, it was right around this time, and I just we hand removed everything. You know. Uh, which I recommend you to do. Sure, there's other applications you can use as far as spraying, which, you know, when you think of spraying, you're thinking of chemicals and they can be hazardous. So um, hand removal is the best. One thing is you always have to uh, consider is life after turf removal. You know, I still get spots here and there where I have grass popping up and I just go remove it by hand, uh, spot treat it using uh, uh, a a concentrated vinegar solution to kind of burn it away. But uh, yeah, it's just, you know, it's really never a bad time to consider removing your grass. You know, um, it's just really about if that, just that want. So if you're interested in doing that turf removal program right now, you know, let's, you know, apply first, take the pictures, measure, get the applications in so you get that approval sooner rather than later. So you can, you know, remove that grass and get to planning. We still have time. Yes, perfect. We got uh, one more here, Juan. Um, do you have any uh, recommendations on reliable landscape contractors and who are knowledgeable in native plants and also do uh, 
great job. You know, that's that's the tricky part always, right? I know we, uh, you know, IRWD, we don't promote uh, landscapers. You know, we there is a, a page on, on our website, our risecape.com website, where we have a list of, um, of landscape contractors, uh, some designers on there. Uh, they've gone through some trainings that we've had, and we've given the opportunity for them to be posted on there. But, you know, it goes back to a little bit of research. And if you're considering native plants, the best place for for answers to this would be a native plant nursery, such as Tree of Life Nursery, um, uh, Las Pilitas. Uh, I I like to go up to um, Theodore Payne Foundation. That's all the way in Sun Valley. Uh, but you know the nurseries that specialize, or the botanical gardens that specialize in natives, such as the California uh, Botanical Garden up in Claremont, you know, used to be known as Rancho Santa Ana. You know, that's where you're going to get your native lovers and people that do design as well. But also there is the CLCA, which is the, the California Landscape Contractors Association website, clca.com, I believe. On that front page, there is a uh, look for landscapers, uh, look for designers or contractors. And you want to go some, you know, you always want to do your research and ask questions, uh, ask for uh, references, you know, before before moving f uh, forward with any any of those uh, landscapers or contractors. But, you know, somebody that's certified and licensed is always a benefit. There's other organizations such as uh, the uh, landscape, uh, this, uh, the LPL, I forget the actual acronym for them, but uh, there's, uh, if you look online, and just type in uh, whether it's landscape architectures or landscape designers. There are some uh, some organizations that uh, you can look towards, but it all depends on the questions, right? You want to make sure that they are specialized in doing California native plants if you're going to go that route. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Juan. Oh, okay. That was it. Good. Okay. Well, everybody, once again, uh, it's, I thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you to our WD staff for being there and assisting me today. And any questions you might have, uh, please uh, send your questions to askwan at irwd.com. Uh, and I'll once again be able to hopefully address uh, any kind of questions you might have. Uh, uh, rather than that, once again, thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful planting season as it begins. And good luck with everybody. And for our rebates, once again, ridescape.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, make sure to apply first, apply first, apply first. And uh, thank you once again for joining us. Everybody enjoy your weekend.